The, the first speaker of today is uh, uh, Dr. Filippo um, Di Parini. Uh, so he is a chemist. Uh, he's got uh, his PhD in chemistry at Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa. Then uh, he did a first postdoc uh, at the Université Pierre et Marie Curie uh, in Paris. Uh, then he was a von Humboldt postdoctoral fellow. And, and then again a postdoc uh, at the uh, Gutenberg University of Mainz. Uh, since 2017, he's assistant professor of physical chemistry uh, at the chemistry uh, department of University of Pisa. It's uh, very uh, nice to have uh, uh, Filippo here. Thank you for uh, accepting to talk uh, at the, uh, this workshop. Thank you. So while I try to share my screen, hopefully I will manage. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Okay, so let me start by thanking very, very much Walter for inviting me. It's a big pleasure for me to be here because I really think that I have something to learn from this series of presentation and from this community. As Walter mentioned, I'm not really into the community that does continuum electrostatics or particle-particle uh, -particle electrostatics from a biophysics point of view. I'm a quantum chemist. so. I will talk about uh, embedding models. So using electrostatic models and in particular polarizable models, but from the point of view of, in some sense, a smaller system, which we describe with quantum mechanics, and for which we don't really care of having an accurate description of the environment itself, let the environment be a protein, which may, may, uh, may also be in solution, but, we care about the effects of the environment on the core, the, the chemically relevant part of the system, which can be a solute in solution, a chromophore embedding in a protein, because this is what we want to study. So in some sense, I'm a bit of a foreigner here. And uh, what I will uh, talk about is from a slightly different perspective, but I will uh, devote, uh, let's say, a relevant part of my talk to uh, theory, because uh, what we want to do is to go in between the particle and the continuum uh, approaches and having something which combines both of them with a peculiarity that we want both of the layers of embedding to be polarizable, and we want to have mutual polarization interaction amongst every uh, component, including, of course, the quantum mechanical one. And this is something which is not so straightforward, especially because of some technical complications that can arise when due to either the formulation or the discretization of your model, you have to deal with something which is not variation. And so I will spend some time presenting some general results about these models and how to couple them, and then talk about two specific models, a uh, polarizable atomistic force field amoeba, and a linear scaling implementation of the conductor-like screening models, so polarization, polarizable continuum model, and their coupling. And we'll talk about uh, how to get a linear scaling implementation of the whole thing, so including of the coupling, and show you some pilot application, not much to show data, this is really a pilot, meaning preliminary work, uh, but just to basically tell you where we are, where we would like to go, what is missing, and to discuss what are the uh, problems shortcoming and things that we need to improve in our present approach. So uh, let's start just in a nutshell, what is a polarizable model? So if you take a cookbook of quantum chemistry and you look in the page of polarizable uh, embedding models, uh, what you will find is that there are very few specific ingredients of such a model from the QMMM perspective. And uh, these are possibly a static charge distribution. So think of uh, QMMM. So you have your MM atoms that are bearing charges, for instance, and these charges are parameters are given. Then you get an inducible charge distribution, something like fluctuating charges, induced dipoles or drude oscillators. And you need a way to compute these um, polarization response. So you get polarization equations. And finally, you get a recipe to compute the polarization energy. Now, these are two separate things because not, this is not always just Coulombic interaction. There might be some additions or complications there. 
I will make a few assumptions through my talk. So the first and the biggest one is that I'm only dealing with linear models, which basically means that we cannot do something like Poisson-Boltzmann. We could do linearized Poisson-Boltzmann with this framework, but not the general uh, Poisson-Boltzmann theory. But this is not something that commonly used in quantum chemistry. Uh, just also to be in the most comfortable position possible, I will assume that every continuum model has been discretized, so I'm not going to deal with operators in inverse spaces, I'm basically going to work in uh, R to the N, and um, I will use a dot product to, to basically denote uh, contractions of uh, quantities. So, that being said, uh, what is and what is not a variational model? So we say that the model is variational when uh, the polarization equations are defined in terms of a positive symmetric matrix or operator, if you wish. And we also need for a model to be variational for the recipe for the energy and the polarization equation to involve the same electrostatic quantity. To make an example, uh, we say for, um, for a model to be variational, you want that the field that induces uh, point dipoles is the same field these point dipoles interact with in order to compute the polarization energy. Now, if both these um, hypotheses hold, then you have what we call a variational embedding model. And there's plenty of them. Fluctuating, fluctuating charges are variational. The naive vanilla, let's say, uh, tall dipole model is variational. And in the continuum part, for instance, Cosmo is variational. And uh, with some work on top of it, the polarizable continuum model can be recast in a variational form. However, there are also plenty of non-variational models, and the two I am going to talk about are both non-variational. Amoeba is non-variational because of the way the interaction energy is defined. And even if you take a standard polarizable continuum model from the quantum chemistry community, something like PCM or SSVPE, while the model in its continuous formulation is variational, uh, the numerical realization, so the boundary element method discretization, is not due to uh, non-perfect faithfulness of the discretization. Uh, this domain decomposition Cosmo I'm going to talk about is also a non-variational model. So uh, these non-variational models are actually quite common and one needs to learn how to deal with them. And this is actually not something that difficult because the thing that you need to do is to brew up a Lagrangian where you have your energy and then you enforce with a Lagrange multiplier your uh, polarization equation. So the ingredients are here, the energy of your quantum mechanical subsystem. I'm probably going to assume that this is described with Consham density functional theory using localized basis functions. Then you have what would be your standard electrostatic embedding components. So for instance, if you have fixed point charges, you will have the self-interaction of these charges and the interaction of the charges with the electronic density. And then you have the polarization energy, which is the interaction of your induced degrees of freedom with the quantum and classical densities. And finally, you have polarization equations that you enforce through the Lagrange multiplier. Now, this is quite straightforward and is also a very convenient way of formulating things because getting the polarization equations is very easy. So if you only need to compute the energy, you can get away with just one linear system of equations. So by differentiating the Lagrangian with respect to the uh, Lagrange multipliers, you get, again, the polarization equations. However, and this is the important thing, if you want to compute derivatives and you do want to compute derivatives for many reasons, then you also need to solve a second set of linear equations in order to compute the Lagrangian. And one, you want to do that because when you differentiate your Lagrangian, which corresponds to the energy once you solve the polarization equations with respect to some external parameter, if you just do chain rule uh, differentiation, then what you will get is that due to the stationarity of the Lagrangian with respect to your polarization and Lagrange multipliers, you get that the total derivative corresponds to the partial derivative. So you get something which is easy to compute. And uh, uh, this avoids to compute this uh, dx over the lambda quantities, which is, of course, a lot of work and you don't want to do, and also allows you to implement easily forces, which are most common derivatives, but also, and this is very relevant for QMMM, uh, contributions to the operators that define your quantum mechanical equations. So 
POC matrix, Comsham matrix, or something like that, which you can define as the analytical derivative of a polarization energy with respect to the density matrix. However, the price to pay when you have a non-variational model is that for each value of the inducing density, you need to solve two different sets of linear equations. So what happens when your model is variational? What happens is that things get much, much simpler. So let's enforce the hypothesis for a variational model. First of all, we want the inducing field to be the same than the interacting field. So this theta becomes a psi. And then if you take the derivatives with respect to S and X, and you use the fact that your operator or matrix is self-adjoint, what you get is basically the same in your system twice. So in this case, the Lagrange multiplier is equal to uh, the polarization. And this makes the Lagrangian become an object which is not only simpler, but also more physically relevant, that is an energy functional. And what is particularly nice about this uh, kind of formulation is that it has a clear cut uh, physical meaning. So if you take the polarization addition to this energy, what you get is that the first term is one half x dot uh, ax is the work that you need in order to polarize your environment. So it's energy that you have to put into the system. And the second term this x dot phi, uh, psi is the energy that you gain by the favorable interaction of your induced degrees of freedom with your polarizing density. So you can see how a variational formulation is very natural because your polarization will be the one that minimizes the self-interaction while maximizing the favorable interaction with uh, your polarizing medium. Now, let's get to the ingredients of my presentation. And the first one is the amoeba force field. Now, the amoeba force field is a very uh, popular polarizable force field. It has a quite big community that develops it, which means that there are parameters uh, available for a very large manifold of systems, which is, of course, very good because parameterizing the force field is definitely not something so pleasant. And uh, it's a quite accurate force field, in particular for its electrostatic and polarization components, which makes it very suitable for polarizable QMM applications. In um, amoeba, each atom is endowed with uh, distributed multiples up to the quadrupole, and uh, the polarization is taken care of with induced dipoles. The polarization equations are the standard induced dipole equations. So your A is a, a matrix with on the diagonal blocks the inverse polarizabilities, and on the off diagonal blocks dipole dipole interaction matrices is symmetric and positive definite. However, due to the way the force field is parametrized, the inducing field is computed in a different way than the polarization field, so the one that you use to compute the energy. So due to this fact, the amoeba force field is not variational. So uh, no problem, we just write down the same Lagrangian that we saw before, putting the things using the names typical of the amoeba community, so you can again see uh, the um, polarization energy minus one half dipoles times fields. And then you have this mu P, which is a Lagrange multiplier that enforces polarization equations. So again, in the context of QMMM, by differentiating this Lagrangian with respect to mu D, the polarization and mu P, the Lagrangians, you get these two systems of uh, linear equations which, as I uh, marked explicitly, depend on the quantum mechanical density. And by differentiating the Lagrangian with respect to the density matrix, you get the uh, effective Consham or Fock matrix, which accounts for the mutual polarization with the environment. You can actually see that these two sets of equations, so the classical and the quantum ones, are coupled, which gives us the mutual polarization, which is what we want. So this is for the atomistic model. Let's come to the uh, continuum model. The continuum model that we work with is a COSMO. Um, it's a very uh, traditional continuum model in quantum chemistry and is a completely electrostatic model for the part we are concerned that represents the solvent, so uh, the medium embedding the molecule as a uniform conductor medium which fills the whole space but a molecular cavity, which is usually made of interlocking spheres and is a vacuum cavity that accommodates the solid. 
Now, of course, we know that solvents are typically not conductors, even though you know that the response with respect to the dielectric constant is uh, sigmoid. So epsilon infinity is a very good approximation starting from medium polarity solvent, but still uh, there are very good empirical scaling factors that can give back the dielectric uh, energy, which is of course uh, very desirable, especially in low polarity solvents. And uh, this is a very simple model. You get away with just solving Poisson equation with a conductor boundary condition. And typically, as our boundaries have these complicated shapes, you need to do that using something like the boundary element method. Now, uh, in a typical quantum mechanics realizations where your sol solute is a small molecule, you just go get the stiffness matrix from a boundary element method, and then you use dense linear algebra to invert it, and then this is not a problem. However, if you want to go to a larger systems, things become a bit more complicated because, of course, you cannot afford n-cube work. And uh, it's well known that boundary element methods for one of the rare interactions tend to give uh, uh, ill-conditioned and, of course, dense uh, stiffness matrices, which means that iterative solvers will struggle. And this is the reason why we decided to go uh, a completely different way. And uh, the solution that we used for our uh, conductor-like screening model uh, implementation is as old as it gets, is a domain decomposition, in particular, Schwarz uh, alternating domain decomposition proposed by you know, the Schwarz of the second uh, derivatives theorem in uh, 1870. So definitely not something very new. And it's a very natural idea because our domain, the cavity, is composed of interlocking spheres. So it's a union of simple domains overlapping. And uh, how does domain decomposition work? Let me illustrate it with a very naive and simple example. So let's assume that we want to solve this uh, uh, ordinary differential equation in uh, 0, 1 with the boundary conditions that I report, where the solution is, of course, the segment. And let's assume that for some reason, we cannot solve it analytically and we cannot solve it in an efficient way from a numerical point of view, but we would be able to do so in uh, intervals that are overlapping, for instance, in zero to three quarters and in one quarters to, z to one. Now, what is the problem here? Of course, we have boundary conditions at zero and one, but we don't have boundary conditions at the boundary of the sub-intervals. So the idea of uh, domain decomposition is to start from a guess. So for instance, let's put it zero. And let's start solving our equation with this approximated boundary condition in the first interval. We get this lousy approximation to our solution. But we also get a value of the potential at the over boundary of the overlapping interval, which we can use in a second iteration to solve in the over interval and get a better approximation and by iterating this procedure, we quickly, or usually quickly converge to the solution. So this is exactly what we want to do for our uh, Cosmo. But um, in the quantum chemistry, this, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, you usually do uh, transform these problems into surface problems. And uh, this is not what we want to do here because there is no clear cut way of defining overlapping uh, boundary um, sets uh, to decompose the surface. So we go back to the standard PDE. We explode our cavity in the uh, components, so the spheres. And then we solve in an iterative fashion um, the Poisson equation in a sphere, which is a trivial thing to do, but uh, with modified boundary conditions to account for the solution in neighboring sphere. And this is the key of the algorithm because as you only exchange information among spheres that actually overlap with each other. What this means is that if, the, if you represent your equations with a stiffness matrix, so we discretize using spherical harmonics, then if two spheres do not overlap, the corresponding blocks in the stiffness matrix will vanish. And this means that the DD Cosmo matrix is going to be sparse, very sparse in particular. And by using sparse algebra and an iterative solver, we achieve linear scaling and computational cost. Now, this is what I was talking about. This is the sparsity profile of the DD Cosmo matrix. And as you can see, it's really very sparse. It's, let's say, 1 to 2% of the elements are non-zero. 
So the solution to this problem can be uh, very efficient. Now, let's get to the part where we want to put things together. And first of all, why do we want to put things together? Well, the thing is that QMMM is great for something like hydrogen bonds, so specific interactions, directional and isotropic interactions. But on the other hand, as one over R never dies, if you want to take care in a reasonable way of long range electrostatic interactions, you need to get very, very large clusters. Otherwise you will have boundary effects also in your central quantum mechanical um, probe or, or core, and this is going to spoil your results. So this is expensive because you, you need to get a very large system, which also means that you need to do sampling and so on and so forth. On the other hand, continuum models are really good at taking care of long range interactions because they do that by solving Poisson equation in an infinite medium. On the other hand, of course, uh, if you have a continuum, you don't have specific interaction, at least not in these, uh, let's say, naive continuum models. In conclusion, uh, what we want to do is to join the strengths of these two models. So use a MM embedding for the close neighbors in order to have a good representation of specific interactions and use a continuum model to take care of long range ones. And uh, while the idea might seem just, you know, some simple algebra, it's actually not that straightforward. And I think that everybody familiar with electrostatic and polarizable electrostatic knows that there's a lot of one-off factors that are not so easy, easy to see or easy to justify. And when you have a model where you have the quantum density, a polarizable atomistic density and a continuum polarizable density, all mutually polarizing each other, not double counting or not missing any of these interactions is not always completely straightforward. Now, if you have variational models, then you can use physics to guide you and things are more or less clear cut. But for non-variational models, things become a bit more cumbersome. So let's start from the simple case, but these variational models. So let's assume that we have two variational models, model one, model two. And let's assume that they interact in a bilinear way, something like Coulomb interaction of the two densities, which is usually what we do. And let's also assume that this interaction, if you extend it to the space spanned by both densities, is um, positive definite. Then it's actually quite easy to write down a coupled energy functional because this is just going to be the sum of the two energies plus the coupling. And uh, you get this polarization equation by imposing the stationarity of this energy function with respect to the two uh, polarizations, which are nothing more than a bigger variational polarization equation. So things are pretty much straightforward here. This is definitely not the case in general. So if you want to couple two polar, uh, polarizable non-variational models, you need to pay a bit more attention because each model will have one polarization and one Lagrangian, but the interaction between the models will be so that the polarization and the the Lagrangian have to interact both with both the polarization and the Lagrangian, which basically means that to couple two models, you need six degrees of freedom. Now, I don't really want to go too much into the, the cumbersome and boring details here, but this is the final result. So you see that the ingredients are the interaction energies of the two models, plus this green interaction between model one and model two. Then you have to enforce polarization of the first model with the first S Lagrange multiplier. Then you have to enforce the polarization equation for both polarization of the second model, the one coupled with X and the one coupled with S. And if you do so, basically this is the end of it. You can do it with any linear model independent of whether it's polar is um, variational or not. This is the most general uh, possibility. And by doing some trivial algebra, you get the associated polarization equations. So you have to solve two sets of coupled polarization equations. I wrote them in this uh, funny way with these two and a half factors because I wanted to uh, underline that basically the second set is the adjoint set of equation to the first one, which is in some sense something that one could expect from um, the fact that one has a polarization equation and Lagrange equations. And uh, 
it's a bit messy. The implementations tend to be a bit cumbersome, but it's just linear algebra. So no, not, nothing really difficult here. And if you're uh, curious of the obnoxious details, you can find them in this paper reported here in, uh, in green. So let's talk about how to make this in practice. And uh, to make this in practice, you need uh, a solver for DD Cosmo, which of course we already have as we have DD Cosmo. And then you need electrostatics. So you have to make interact polarization density with distributed multiples, induced dipoles, and stuff like that. There are a few minor complications. For instance, you might want to damp the electrostatic interaction to avoid singularities, and you might want to exclude some interactions due to the way the force field are parameterized. But that's basically it. And then from the quantum mechanical point of view, you only need very standard one electron integrals, potential and derivatives. Basically, every quantum chemistry code can do that. So let's get to the electrostatic part. So this is, let's say, a mostly general expression of things that you have to compute. So this is an energy. So basically, is a classical second year undergrad physics uh, uh, multi multiple multiple interaction energy where the differences are these scaling factors, which might be used to remove unwanted interaction, and the presence of this damping function to make the Coulomb interaction go to a finite value when two atoms get too close. And uh, all these rules depend on the specific force field. For instance, in amoeba, you have various exclusion rules that are based either on polarization groups or on connectivity. And... Uh, um, you have to be a bit careful with that, but there's nothing very difficult. And the nice thing is that independent of any quantity you want to compute, uh, you will always be able to write it as either an electrostatic quantity, electric field uh, produced by the induced dipoles, a field gradient produced by the quadrupoles, something like that, or by the contraction of some source with an electrostatic quantity. For instance, forces are charges times electric field. And this is the key to our implementation. And why is it the key? Because if you look at this, this is clearly scaling like n square, and n square is not good. And it's not good here, but it's even worse when you have to solve this linear system, which are dense. And again, this is electrostatic, so the off-diagonal part is computing the field produced by the induced dipole, but this is, can be a pretty large linear system. And uh, yes, it's a symmetric positive definite si uh, linear system, so conjugate gradient will do magics, but it's still quite expensive. How expensive? So let me um, just uh, emphasize this very lonely green point, which is uh, dense linear algebra, definitely not a good idea. And even if you go for conjugate gradients, so iterative solution, you can clearly see the quadratic scaling and you can clearly see that even for not so big system, things become very expensive. And you have to consider that if you want to do QMMM, this is something that you might have to do 15, 20 times per single calculation, because you have to do it at every SCF cycle if you are doing, the, for instance, DFT. So to go anywhere, Basically, you have no other choice but to get this to be linear scaling. And uh, the way we do it is with FMM. Now, I probably shouldn't tell you about FMM because you probably all know it much better than I do. But um, I'm a bit fascinated by this technique because I find it so, so elegant and brilliant that just indulge with me and let me talk about it for a minute. And the idea is super simple and very elegant and based on a very simple idea. So we want to compute the electrostatic potential of these red particles in that other circle. So we place a reference system, we write down the potential, we use spherical harmonic addition theorem, and by grouping together the uh, pink and the cyan uh, quantities, we can rewrite this as the contraction of a multipolar expansion times irregular spherical harmonic. This is not the only way to do that. We can also put our reference in the, the other circle and then group things a bit differently. So if we group together the uh, blue and red stuff, we get what's called a local expansion contracted with regular spherical harmonics. And uh, of course, the local and multipolar expansions are related with something which resembles the resolution of the identity. So if you have one, you can compute the other one. 
And that's basically it. Because once we have that, let's assume that we want to compute the interaction of a particles in box B with particles in box A. If we do it in a direct way, this is going to cost us n A times n B operations. So what we do is we compute multipolar distributions for the particles in box B. This costs order of NB particles, so-called particle to multiple step. Then we transform our uh, multipolar expansion into local expansion. This doesn't depend on uh, the number of particles. And then finally, we use local expansion to compute the potential. And we went from Na times Nb to Na plus Nb. Now, if you want to do FMM, things are a bit more involved. So I stole this very beautiful image from the EXA FMM um, website. EXA FMM is the fast multiple method library, which is uh, meant to be used on big computers or on GPUs. It's actually very efficient, and they did this uh, very, very uh, nice uh, picture. Um, there is an alternative to FMM, which is to use a tree code, which is in some sense just half of FMM. It's probably comparably fast unless you go to like super, super, super large system and significant, significantly less obnoxious to implement. So if you have to do it from scratch, I would probably recommend to go to a tree code because implementing FMM can be a bit nasty. But this is basically how we get electrostatics in a linear stabilization. Now, DB Cosmo doesn't have this problem because as the matrix that determines it, determines it is sparse, it's not really linear scaling. So we only have to care about the coupling with amoeba and the coupling term are either very easy or also something that we can write as electrostatic quantities times the source. So we can also use FMM to achieve global linear scaling. And this is how this actually works in practice. So this is the time uh, as a function of the number of atoms embedded in uh, DD Cosmo to solve uh, direct adjoint equations and also to compute uh, the forces. And you can see that this is, of course, linear scaling and also overall quite cheap. And the same goes for amoeba to compute the induced dipoles with FMM. Again, you get linear scaling and overall, all these calculations are done on a pretty old single server, I think is 12 cores from 2013. So not really a powerful machine and you can really handle big system without uh, big for QMMM, not big for biophysics, of course, uh, systems without uh, major complications. What happens if we put things together? Well, first of all, these are, let's say, all the various parts of this matrix vector product that you have to do. So the DD Cosmo part, the amoeba part, and all the couplings, and uh, the computation on the right hand side. And uh, what you can see from this log log pl uh, plot, so the, the dashed or dotted uh, gray lines are um, coef the coefficient of this line is one, so it's linear scaling. You can see that basically everything is linear scaling. DD Cosmo is slightly more than linear due to the fact that the number of iterations tends to increase a bit with, the, uh, with larger systems, but is I think 1.08 the, the scaling, so it's almost linear. However, things get quite more expensive. Now, what do we want to do with that? So typical problem that we want to a tackle is we have a chromophore embedded into a protein, in this case a mutant of a green fluorescent protein here, and this protein is again in water. So the QMMM way of doing that is to take larger and larger clusters, adding solvent, and uh, compute the property until you get convergence. The three-layer way of doing that is to do both uh, MM embedding and then surrounding it with the continuum. And what is that we hope? We hope that properties will converge faster. And this is what we observe. So the, the values at zero are the non-embedded system. So you can see that there is actually a big effect due to the environment. These are excitation energies and transition dipoles for uh, two mutants of GFP. And what you see are two things. First of all, that the blue lines, the one with the three layers, converge faster. And the second one is that they oscillate less, um, which is good because you mean that even if you don't do your homework very well and you cut things a bit sooner, you are probably not going to, you know, uh, happen to be in an unfortunate point where the error is particularly large. Now, 
one small comment about why we want to go to these complicated coupled polarizable models. Uh, the thing is that if you compute molecular response properties uh, from a quantum mechanical point of view, having a polarizable embedding gives an explicit contribution to the molecular response function. So it alters the way your molecule responds to an external perturbation, which is not something that happens if you have a non-polarizable embedding. And this sometimes can make a big difference. So here in this uh, uh, slide, I'm comparing the results with the polarizable and the non-polarizable description. And you can see that the non-polarizable description has the environment blue shifting uh, the excitation, while the polarizable one has the environment red shifting the excitation. So two different qualitative behaviors. And uh, to, let's say, assess which one is the right one, we did fully quantum mechanical computations on, well, the larger system we could afford. We, you cannot really go too far with full quantum mechanics here. And you can see that the full quantum mechanical computation go in the same direction as the polarizable ones. This is not to say that you should use always in every case a polarizable embedding, because in a lot of cases, the non-polarizable one will just work as fine. The thing is that you never really know. And in our opinion, having a, let's say, this physical polarization contribution and this uh, addition to the response kernel are you know, a plus value of uh, using these models, even though they are much more expensive. How expensive? Well, we can look at this picture in two ways. Uh, much more expensive, not as much more expensive as we feared. Um, when we first ran this calculation, we were thinking, okay, the free layer is going to be 20, 30 times more expensive than just QMM Inva. It turns out this is about three times more expensive, which is not that bad. Now, is it worth it? Well, the question we have to ask is, if using a free layer uh, model, we converge our properties in this zone, and using the two-layer model, we converge our, our properties in this zone, then perfect. Otherwise, then this is yet not convenient. And the, the, the true answer is that at the moment, this is not the case. So using a three-layer model gives you converged properties at the size, which makes the calculation a tiny bit, let's say 5% more expensive than what you would get with the fully atomistic level. But what is still missing here? Well, uh, okay, this I already said, the thing that we still don't know, I can tell you we have limited experience on that, is what happens to sampling? Because of course, if you take a protein and a chromophore and you do a single UVV's response calculation, what you get is nothing significant because you have to sample the conformational space of your protein in order to get the representative picture of your system. And the idea is that if you have a smaller system, because you could crop it a bit more thanks to the continuum taking care of long-range interaction, it might be the case that you get a faster convergence of your properties with respect to the number of, of uh, configurations that you need to take care of. Now, this is something that we saw in the examples that we made, but it's not something that I can prove. So at the moment is a, let's say, a wishful thinking in some sense, but it's reasonable wishful thinking. So this can be a game changer. And then the other thing is that the QMAMIBA implementation is now a mature implementation. It's already well-established, well-optimized. Uh, this is definitely not the case for the three layer implementation, which is something that started working not much more than one month ago. So we are, let's say, at the beginning of the road in this sense. And what is that we want to do there? Well, the first thing is that we did somewhat naive implementation, especially of the coupled equations. We just do a macro, micro, mi macro iteration uh, solution. There might be better ways of doing that. And then the other thing, and this is why I'm so happy of being here because I might learn something, is that uh, at the moment, uh, we're using a very naive OpenMP implementation. So we are so, so far away from Exascale, but I, I, I'm a bit ashamed of being here at the moment. And uh, the thing is, going parallel here, 
there, there is going to be the limitation of the quantum mechanical part in the end. But if the cost of the classical one becomes really, really a determining step in the calculation, and we are close to there, uh, parallelization in a more extended way is definitely an option because FMM is good in parallel, or at least this is what the experts told me. And because uh, DD Cosmo is definitely something that you, you can parallelize uh, very well because of local communications and stuff like that. Um, one even more interesting option is to use GPUs. This is because both the FMM and the DD Cosmo computations are, let's say, high um, floats, but not that much memory intensive. So GPUs sound like probably the first thing that we would like to try. And this should definitely help to speed things up. And then there is another thing that at, at the moment we are doing a molecular cavity, even for the QMMM, where we put one sphere per atom, hydrogens included, and this is definitely not the smartest thing to do. Um, it's not so simple to do DD Cosmo on a cavity which doesn't have one atom per sphere, but we are definitely working in that direction. So, uh, to conclude, I think I presented you. So, the road to exascale for us is I am at a crossing and there is a road sign that says, oh, in 30 kilometers, there is going to be a road that connects to the motorway that goes to exascale. So we are very far away from them, but we know that this is the future. And uh, we know that the, let's say, the protein electrostatics and biophysics community are much more in contact with that. So uh, in some sense, thanks again, Walter, for inviting me, because uh, I think this is going to be a very useful experience for me. Uh, I hope that you appreciated the different point of view, so the one from the small quantum mechanical uh, description to the larger systems. And uh, I would like to thank uh, my research group, uh, molecular group in Pisa, led by Professor Benedetta Mennucci, Michele Nottoli, who is the very, very brilliant PhD student who did most of the work that I presented, and uh, my three favorite mathematicians, uh, Benjamin Stamm, Eric Conces, and Yvonne Madet, who are, uh, let's say, the creators in some sense of the idea that stays behind uh, the domain the composition uh, Cosmo models, very good friends of mine and uh, amazing collaborators. Uh, just a small advertisement, we have a PhD and postdoc position available in PISA, so if you're interested, uh, please uh, get in contact. And this is uh, the group. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Filippo, that was a really interesting talk and very nice picture, actually, also here. Uh, so uh, before other people may ask their questions, uh, I have uh, one myself. Uh, if you would do a, a profiling of, uh, of the overall um, procedure, uh, what do you think it would be the, uh, let's say, the lowest hanging fruit in order to speed up the calculations? Where, where would you start? It's definitely the cost. Um, this is due to the fact that we basically, when we solve for the dipoles, we do one iterative step on the dipoles, and then we fully solve up to certain precision the Cosmo. So mm. for each uh, calculation, there are a lot of the Cosmo solves. And um, this is definitely the bottleneck in the, in the computation at the moment. Okay, thank you. Are there uh, other questions from the other participants? Uh, yes, there is a, a question from uh, Rob Krasny. Oh. Now, now I feel a bit embarrassed about talking about FMM, but I noticed that you're there. <laughs> I'm going to be uh, embarrassed by asking uh, questions about chemistry. Um, so thank you, Filippo, for a very nice talk. But I, I do have some questions I'd like to ask um, for, my, for my education. On one of the early slides, um, you had uh, A colon and then damped dipole-dipole interaction. Oh, uh, yes. And di damped was in parentheses. Me. Yes. So what, what do you mean by damped? So what I mean is that, so when we compute these induced dipoles uh, with, that with the, 
making sure that. Sorry for that. Uh, I'm getting there. It is okay. So this is the equations that we solved. And these are the, this T12, T1n are dipole dipole interaction tensors. Now, if you get two particles quite close, this blow up. And uh, this is, of course, a source of uh, instability, especially if you do a molecular dynamics, it can happen, but atoms get closer. And um, uh, as a consequence, instead of doing uh, this calculation using the Coulombic interaction, we replace the Coulombic interaction with something which is dressed with a function that um, eliminates the singularity. So we treat uh, the dipole-dipole interaction as if instead of having point dipoles, we have like uh, something like a p-exponential function, something like that. I see. Okay. And on, I think on the previous slide, you circled the, the lambda. Uh, yeah. RIJ, that, that's also an example of... of, of exactly. Damping. And so, but you, you like to put an exponential decay there? Uh, right? Yeah, basically we smear the dipoles so that they have an exponential profile. Uh, instead of being like a Dirac delta, we are decaying exponential. Now, but I mean, the decaying exponential would, would, would decrease the far field, right? Uh, but it would still blow up, wouldn't it? If, if, uh, if... Okay, no, maybe I didn't make, uh, I didn't explain that correctly. So basically we, we, we we build our interaction as instead of having point particles, we have a, let's say a continuous distribution with an exponential shape. Okay, so it could be a Gaussian, for example. Yes, Gaussian. yes, okay. Gaussian is also used. Okay, okay, fair enough. I see. Okay, very good. Um, I, I, I don't want to monopolize uh, the time on questions. I, I have a few more uh, that I would ask. Well, you I, I think you can you, you you can go yeah yeah please. okay you, you had at one point mu, mu p and mu d yes what what is the distinction I didn't catch that so this is the amoeba notation so mu d is they, they call them the direct dipoles and these are the actual this is the actual polarization mu p is the Lagrange multiplier associated with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It has the physical dimension of a dipole too, so this is why mm -hmm. we call it mu p. Okay. Okay. You you didn't mention anything, I think, about periodic boundary conditions. Are are um, are, th are those of uh, less interest, or or just there wasn't enough time to say anything? But uh... so um, in uh, let's say the, the the quantum chemistry community, we usually work with localized basis functions and in no, a non-periodic setting. Mm -hmm. So all of the, the things that I, I showed are in non-periodic settings, which is one of the reasons why it's so interesting to have a continuum at the boundary to take care of uh, long-range interactions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll just um, make a, an observation that, of course, there, there are many versions of the FMM. Yeah. And, um, um, and so we, we really have to compare. And, uh, you know, they can all be O of N, but then... What's critical, and you you know you brought this out, I think, at the end, is how well they parallelize. Yeah. And some may be more or less uh, easily uh, parallelized or efficiently parallelized. And um, so I have a, a new version that's recently out of a, of a of an FMM uh, that's mm -hmm. accelerated. I'll, I'll I'll forward that to you uh, at some point. That would be very very kind of you. I would appreciate it very very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for your talk. It was nice to see you again. Likewise. Okay, are there other questions? Yes, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a, um, a kind of remark on concerning the FMM also. Um, I mean, you, you, you mentioned that the FMM is uh, quite well scaling and, and uh, paralyze, paralyzed. Um, the question there is, of course, how many particles are you using there? And if you're in the regime of uh, up to 10,000 particles, I think it's, it's quite limited how many processors you can use for the FMM also in this case. And um, if you really want to go to to large number of processors, you might also have kind of hybrid implementation. So um, uh, uh, task decomposition uh, in your, your overall setting and that you only part of the processors would, would take care on the FMM. Um, 
another point uh, Jean to mention here or announce simply is that uh, one talk of the uh, seminar series will be also devoted to the implementation of the FMM, also to the parallelization of the FMM. Uh, that will be one of the September talks by Ivo Kabatschow from Jülich. Excellent. Thank you very much. So if and, I can just... And by the way, this uh, this um, version of the FMM is also included in a in an electrostatics library, which is called Scafacos, which is also available in, uh, in LAMPS. Thank you. Um, so about the size of the system. So for the... Typical applications that we do, we probably won't go much further than a few hundred thousand atoms, which means that it probably makes no sense to use more than maybe a few hundred processors. So yes, definitely. I, I, I mean, this is not astrophysics, where you, you, you have these huge simulations with millions and millions of particles but yeah uh, take as a rule of thumb maybe 100 particles per processor would be yeah okay yeah? i think that that's a kind of limit which could could uh, take as a rule of thumb thank you so uh, coming back to your last comment Filippo, the exascale would really be in, let, let's say you manage to find some some solution some trick in order to uh, improve the performance and the the, the parallelism the scaling of, of your uh, overall algorithm would the exascale capabilities be of help so <laughs> the thing is that in the end what is going to draw us back is the quantum mechanical part and uh, I mean, sure, large quantum mechanical calculations can be distributed. There are definitely parallel codes there. It's still a little memory bound more than CPU bound maybe. And many things are really not so easy to distribute or parallelize. Um, we are still talking about calculation where you use dense linear algebra to di diagonalize matrices. So I think that in order to port this to an access case system with success, even by you know, scheduling different tasks on different groups of processors, we need a bit of a change of paradigm in the localized basis function quantum chemistry community. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. This is my personal opinion. Yeah, that, 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 that's actually, I, I was thinking at the end of the seminar to send a, a questionnaire to the to the attendees in order to have a final idea of what they do believe uh, uh, the, that, that, that pushing the, the, the boundaries of, of the uh, computational architecture can really transform their field or if they believe it, it will not, at least in the, in the foreseeable future, do this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>